Force Radio apparel and accessories are now available on our website. Say it loud and say it proud with RFR t-shirts, hats, mugs, phone cases, water bottles, coffee mugs, pajamas, baby wear, stickers, buttons, even tie-dye. Sizes for men and women. Choose from cool colors and styles. Visit rebelforceradio.com and click on shop to get your RFR gear today. May the force be with you, bro. The fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. All right, shut, shut, everybody. Welcome back to Rebel Force Radio. Great to be with you. We are fresh. We are tanned. We are rested. We are relaxed after a little time off uh, for the uh, Fourth of July holiday here in the States. Great to be back with all of you. Thank you for taking the time out to be with us uh, this week's show for July 15th, uh, 2021. And what a show it is. Coming up later on in the cantina, our good pal, uh, filmmaker Kyle Newman going to be joining us, and we'll talk all things Star Wars, including fanboys. And uh, we solicited some questions from our Patreon members for Kyle specifically about fanboys. Uh, as it, it, gosh, that film is now what 12, 13 years old now. It's crazy. We uh, be talking about all of that and so much more with Kyle. It's been a while since we caught up with him last time, and we've since seen the end of Mandalorian season two. We've had uh, the Bad Batch show up, and of course, the announcement of all these uh, Star Wars television series uh, coming up on Disney Plus. So we'll get Kyle's take on that. Um, speaking of Disney Plus, we were treated to a trailer of Star Wars Visions, and that seems to be the next show on deck for uh, for Disney Plus. And uh, Patty Jenkins, the director of Rogue Squadron, uh, talking a little bit, a little bit about that film, and we'll have uh, audio highlights from her and uh, so much more. But uh, to help me out with that, you know him, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. Happy to be back from our break. I was able to hang out with Dominic Pace, Gecko the Bounty Hunter from The Mandalorian. We spent some time this past weekend here in Chicago as he's on his small business tour. So I suggest you uh, check out Dominic Pace on Facebook and get the lowdown on where he's headed next. And if he's out by your neck of the woods on his small business tour, you got to go. Because, uh, you know, we don't have Star Wars celebration this summer. It's been postponed. It's been put off till next year. So any opportunity to get together with fellow Star Wars fans, costumed characters, cosplay, and hang out and talk the wars at a comic shop or wherever Dominic lands. It's it's just such a pleasure as we emerge from this pandemic. The pandemic's still happening, but we're emerging, and Dominic <laughs> is heading to your town most likely. So go see him and tell him RFR sent you. Had a great time with Dominic this past weekend. Also looking forward to talking to Kyle Newman because the last few times we've had Kyle on the show, he's been a very busy guy. He's been a very busy guy. He's been writing books about Dungeons and Dragons. He's directing a new film called One Up, which is currently in post-production. And uh, he's just been too busy. I, I felt like we lost Kyle. We we lost our, our one of our Jedi members of the, on the council. He, he'd gone off to slay dragons and <laughs> hang out in dungeons. And uh, <laughs> make movies. But no, Kyle is still a hardcore Star Wars fan, as he's always been. So I'm looking forward to having him on the show and talking to him outside of a roundtable, after-show environment where we can just talk randomly about Star Wars. Who knows what we'll talk about. But I definitely do know we will also be talking fanboys because, as Jason said, we've solicited questions from our patreon community and uh there'll be uh, definitely an opportunity for us to ask a few of them of kyle uh 
specifically about fanboys. So I'm looking forward to that. Plus, uh, speaking of Patreon, we got a big giveaway that's going to be happening exclusively for members of RFR on Patreon. More info on that coming up later in the show. And trust me, this is a good one. This is a, a unique giveaway, something you you can't, uh, it's a Star War, a piece of Star Wars you can't get anywhere else except via RFR on Patreon. And it'll be a giveaway open to all members of RFR on Patreon. More details about that coming up later in the show. As Jason said, Patty Jenkins talking about Rogue Squadron and so much more. So I'm looking really forward to getting our feet back into Star Wars fan territory after taking a few uh, days off. And I tell you, I was flipping through the official uh, Rebel Force Radio Facebook group uh, looking for the photos of you and the Babu freaks uh, at the Dominic Pace event. Because it just seems like yesterday I saw these. But I had to scroll so far down. That just goes to show you how active that group is. It's unbelievable. They're very active. Um, but we do have this this wonderful shot of uh, you guys <laughs> at the uh, at the event with Dominic. Dominic sporting a Bears jersey. I love it. Yeah. Is that, is that Walter, Walter Payton? Payton? Yeah. Oh, is That's he? a classic 34. <laughs> and he's standing there with Tyler Page from the Babu Freaks. And uh, to my side, uh, Chris Amorum, RFR graphic design artist mm-hmm. and good friend of the show from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, Mr. Rich Brendel. And, oh, you can see peeking over Chris's shoulder is Barry Harmon. Oh, there he and is. And the lovely little one. little daughter. Yeah. yeah, and the little one. So, you know, it's always great to see these guys. Always good to hang out. We're getting uh, rained on a little bit there on the north side of Chicago. But uh, afterwards, Dominic gathered up the gang, and uh, we all went out for a nice Italian meal across the street. And it was just a, just a great time. Dominic Pace, he's a, he's a, he's a real, he's the real deal. What a great guy. Yes, for sure. Uh, before we jump into news headlines, do want to wish a very happy birthday to the legendary Harrison Ford, uh, celebrating his 79th birthday this week as wow. the show drops. And, uh, of course, wishing him a speedy recovery as he was injured on the set of the latest Indiana Jones film. And it sounds like it's a it's not a little injury. Of course, when you're 79 years old, I don't know that there is such a thing as a little injury. Um, But, uh, boy, as I've said many times before, I'd love to look like he looks now at 43. I'd like to look like he does. Mm. But at 79. But. Um, and just a little bit of pop culture twist. It just so happens he shares a birthday with none other than Jean-Luc Picard, actor himself, <laughs> Professor Xavier uh, Patrick Stewart. So uh, Star Trek fans and Star Wars fans and fans of X-Men have reason to celebrate this week. Uh, Do so we know how birthday. old Sir Patrick is? That's how, a good question. How, how old is Patrick Times Stewart? around the sun has that guy done? Uh, I mean, when I say times around the sun, I mean on the planet, not in a starship. Yeah, uh, he's 81. Oh, my God. 81. And he's in great shape. Talk about great. Good Lord. If you watch Picard, say what you want about Picard, the series, you still have to marvel at the, uh, you know, the presence that he continues to have and the charisma he continues to have on screen. There's there's no 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 denying that. So these guys are just, yeah, incredible. So happy birthday. I can see your belly. <laughs> Yes, on of your course. birthday. He endeared himself to Rebel Force Radio listeners a long time ago as he called out James Corden. But uh, we and we re- we just relived that not too long ago. So that's a that's a that's a classic bit. But uh, for now, let's just go in and we'll hit the headlines. I can see your belly. I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer. I have good news. Uh, We mentioned this uh, very briefly on the last uh, Bad Batch After Show. So if you're not watching the Bad Batch or the Bad Batch After Show, please do so. You can catch those. Of course, they're on the regular podcast feed, but you can see those happen live uh, either on Friday nights or Saturday afternoons. Um, So if you're, you know, check out the Bad Batch first and then join us on the After Show. They're broadcast live on YouTube and uh, there's a number that you can call and you can be part of the discussion. We take the live calls and... uh, it's a, it's a lot of fun. But, Jim, we mentioned Star Wars Visions. That trailer dropped last week. And it's relevant because we were talking about what's going what's gonna to keep us occupied as Star Wars fans between, Star War, between uh, The Bad Batch, which is likely going to wrap up here at the end of the month or, or early August, and then The Book of Boba Fett, which we won't get until December. Is there going to be anything in between? And uh, you threw out um, Star Wars Visions, this uh, anime 
uh, anthology series that's 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 coming. And um, something else that you revealed, and we'll get into into the trailer, but something that you had mentioned, you'd speculated that you think that this will all drop at once. This isn't going to be something that's episodic in terms of you know a, a different episode or installment every week. Yeah, that's right. I, I think the whole thing will drop at once on September 22nd. And it'll be, yeah, more like Netflix than the traditional Disney Plus uh, release of weekly. Uh, they've given us no indication that this will be weekly. That's why I look at it as a big content dump happening on the 22nd. And we'll get all these shorts. There are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine different ones. And uh, they're done by all of these different anime studios. And I'll be the first one. You know, I, I, I'm not going to speak for Jason, but I, I, I think I, I probably can get away with saying that neither me or Mr. Swank are anime experts. And so we'll be looking at this presentation purely through a Star Wars lens. But we know that Anime has lots of fans, especially young fans. Young mm. fans of animation love anime. And I grew up on certain levels of anime myself. I mean, I remember the old G-Force, which uh, mm. to me was very Star Wars-esque of a show. And uh, Voltron, of course. Uh, those are a couple of things that I'm a little bit familiar with. I did not grow up in the Pokemon era and have very little connection to Pokemon, but I have seen it. And uh, that's about as deep as I go. So you can tell I'm pretty much anime illiterate. And I know a lot of our listeners are way into anime. I might be looking for an anime expert down the road when Star Wars Visions actually launches. So yeah, I don't want to ignore the fact that this is probably more on the anime side than it is on the Star Wars side as far as its presentation goes. But I don't know. You know, I, I, I can't judge that. It's just so out of universe. It's it's what if. It's alternate universe. It's Star Wars Infinities. It's not canon. And what I'm seeing are some visuals that are associated with anime more than Star Wars, for sure. Like, there's a furry in here. There's a character who's, you know, like a furry, like... You know, like a, a an animal human hybrid <laughs> creature. <laughs> a furry. I don't know how else to describe them, but I've seen similar characters like that in mm. anime in the past. There, right there, we just yeah. saw a glimpse of it on the screen as Jason's running the uh, beautiful visuals uh, on some of these quick shots. So I, I think we're going to be in for like a really spectacular visual treat with some of this uh, anime and. Um, well, it I sounds just, to me know, like they've ooh, got some of the major Husky studios readers. and the major anime artists, you know, that, that are working on this, yeah. the, the top of the top. And they're all what, what's interesting is that, you know, despite the fact that in this in this uh, trailer that, you know, many of them are not speaking English and it's subtitles, but their passion for Star Wars, it, it comes through. And it's so clear that Star Wars has influenced them. You know, despite the language mm -hmm. barrier, you know, Star Wars is something that is so cross-cultural that these, pe that these people grew up in, and, and, and likely like our own filmmakers in the States and in, in the West grew up and, and wanted to have a, a, a career in telling stories because of Star Wars. And here they are getting a chance to use their medium to tell Star Wars. And on the other side of the coin, while these anime directors and producers may have been heavily influenced by star Wars. Star Wars itself was heavily influenced by Japanese cinema, specifically Akira Kurosawa. We all know George Lucas and what an impact hidden fortress had on star Wars. And we've seen the seven samurai being replayed uh, over and over again in star Wars storytelling, most recently on the Mandalorian. And uh, there's that little furry again. Uh, <laughs> see, see what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, they, they, yeah, they, they have a uh, furries have a meetup at the galloping ghost every once in a while. You go <laughs> oh in God. There's all these, yeah. Be all careful. These characters running around. <laughs> you see them at conventions a lot of times too. They freak out my son. Oh but, boy. Uh, <laughs> And he explained to me there's a seedier side of furries, Yes, too. there is. But yes, no, 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 whatever. <laughs> but as you see, like, I mean, the imagery I'm seeing yeah. in this trailer, that was a weird Boba Fett thing. Um, the imagery I'm seeing 
harkens more of traditional anime to me than traditional Star Wars. Right. And uh, that's that's something that, um, you know, I, I, I worry I'm, I'm going to have to grapple with. But I don't think so because Star Wars is so universal in its, you know, its appeal, at least to me. Yeah, you could give a couple of uh, munchkins from the Wizard of Oz some lightsabers, and I'm enthralled. Sign me up, you know. Yes, I mean, it's, it could be like something literal like that. Um, well, it does but, seem to uh, be like you say, Jim. It does seem to be more of an exercise in um, showcasing the medium, the art, the style that is anime uh, w- within a in, within a the, the framework of Star Wars. It doesn't seem as though this is an attempt to expand the canon of Star Wars, which is what we've come to expect from from Disney Plus, from Disney Plus series. Uh, they they contribute to the canon, whereas this seems a little bit more experimental. This, I'll tell you what this feels like, to be honest with you. This feels like something right up George Lucas's alley, because George oh, yeah. loves, uh, obviously loves uh, Asian culture and um, and and and. and when you take star Wars and, and sort of mash it up with, with um, you know, these different styles, it just, it just, this feels like something we would have seen from George uh, actually feels more George star Wars than it does Disney star Wars in that sense. Cause he loved these little kind of projects. Back when George owned the company, there was star Wars celebration, Japan. It happened in 2008. I got to go. So I was lucky to be there and actually, experience Japanese Star Wars fandom boots on the ground experience Star Wars Japanese fandom and those fans are just as passionate as fans anywhere else on the planet they love Star Wars in Japan there's no question about it and I ex- I expect that sensibility to come through with uh, these these cool new uh, anime features, uh, shorts that are coming. We have a list of titles mm. and, uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, we'll try to assume some things out of these titles. The first one up is the duel. So I'm assuming that'll be a lightsaber battle of some sort. The next one, Lop and Ocho, Lop and Ocho, maybe some droids mm. on a wacky droid adventure. Uh, the next one is Tatooine Rhapsody. Okay. Now, one of the studios is producing a rock opera, a Star Wars rock opera, a Star Wars anime rock opera. All right, I'm in. Okay. I'm in. So you check it <laughs> off a few boxes there. I think yeah. Tatooine Rhapsody might be that rock opera. Um, <laughs> the Trigger Studio is doing The Twins and The Elder. So the mm-hmm. twins, obviously a forced dyad of some sort, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Han, or I mean, Luke and Leia, or uh, Jason and Jaina, if you want to go EU. <laughs> um, <laughs> the twins. And then you have the elder, which is probably then about, a, you know, a more distinguished samurai type of Jedi living out his last battle, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, the next one, the village bride. So, uh, you know, my big fat Greek wedding, Star Wars style, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> I, unlikely. <laughs> um, Akakiri and two, T0B1 from Science Saru Studio. Mm. Um, I think that might be... No specula- uh, It might be a little play on words here that it might be 2B1, but like 2B1? I don't know. Oh, yeah, 2B1. And uh, Production IG is producing The Ninth Jedi. That's very the specific. Ninth Jedi. Very well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, what happened to the first eight? You know, is it, or is this like a 009 situation or something? Yeah. <laughs> so if I don't come back, O's. if I don't come back, 008 will replace me. 009. The Ninth Jedi. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we have some audio um, highlights from the trailer. These are members of the production team talking about Star Wars Visions. Star Wars Visions is going to be an exciting anime anthology series coming to Disney Plus in September. 
Japanese animation inspired a lot of the people at Lucasfilm over the years. We loved the idea of seeing Star Wars expressed in that way. Each one of these studios that we approached, we found hardcore Star Wars fans. They all had a story they wanted to tell. We were looking for something from the heart and soul of the individual creators. They are their visions through the lens of Star Wars. There are so many genres at play, big and bold, romantic and sweeping, funny, comedic. We try to have some retro, vintage feeling. We feel so fortunate to be working with these filmmakers. There are so many opportunities to reflect Japanese storytelling in a Star Wars universe. Yeah, so well, very interesting. Y- you bring up a great point, though, Jim, earlier when you said that, you know, yes, clearly uh, Star Wars has influenced so many over the last 40 plus years. Um, but it was Japanese culture, the Akira Kurosawa films and and this, the, the legend of the samurai that inspired George Lucas. So this is uh, sort of Star Wars coming home in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're looking for the next installment in Star Wars uh, canon or the unfolding saga, I don't think you're going to find it here. I think what you're going to find oh, no. here is, is uh, as you said, a real visual treat, a lot of exciting, if you're, particularly if you're a fan of anime, uh, you're going to love this. But um, uh, more likely a one and done. Now, what I'm curious about is the format of the show itself, if it's going to be like somewhat um documentary style like you'll hear from the creators and then it will show their short and then they'll roll Mm. into the next one um or if it will be you know just a series of of shorts back to back to back to back i'm curious as to what that format's going to be we don't know well i think it'll be click and play for each for each one interesting short Uh, there may be a play all option hmm. and that is if they do the content dump all in one day a la Netflix. And that's really where I think they're going. They, 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 you know, they're never very clear about these kind of things. Lucasfilm always, always working in the shadows, these guys, and never really telling you everything you need to know, because I don't think they want you to have any sort of preconceived notion going into the whole thing to begin with. Um, and just, you know, making a big point about hitting the platform on September 22nd, what you see you know, might be a surprise. <laughs> might be right. one episode for all I know. I because that unconfirmed stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I really think that's how it's going to be. It's just going to be a content dump, and uh, you, you click and play, just that, like you did with the shorts, the sh- like the Star Wars biome shorts or mm. the Star Wars. By the way, walkthroughs. I, I, have you watched the biomes? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. See, I yeah. didn't. You know, we didn't really talk about it here on the show. Uh, if at all. And I, um, a, a friend of mine had said, have you watched these? And I, I said, no, I haven't. And I've been spending a lot of my evenings, uh, out on my screened in porch and I've, I've hung a screen. I have a projector and, uh, I put those biomes on and man, was that cool. Just the atmosphere, the, 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 the sound effects, the music, the scenery, um, that was something that was just a, it was a real treat. I didn't realize how cool it was. I, I didn't even really know what it was. And someone said, well, you should put that on. And uh, uh, they actually said to me that they, 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 they loop it sometimes, you know, or they wish that there were, sorry, they wish there was a loop option because they just love mm-hmm. the atmospheric uh, uh, elements of it. So that's very cool. But you're, you're, you're right. It may just be one of those big icons that you see on the Disney plus home screen, you click on it. And then from there you can jump around from, uh, from short to short to short. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to see if there was some narrative just in terms of hearing from the filmmakers themselves. Cause I think for those of us, particularly in the West, it might be helpful to have that, that context if they sort of, you know, are able to tee it up. I need it teed up for me a little bit. I, I think. Sure. Sure. That may be a crawl, but um, <laughs> you could, uh, you could also, Maybe you think there's going to be a Disney gallery special about visions mm. too that might help you flesh out where these guys are coming from. Of course, there was a big announcement this week Disney gallery. There's going to be an episode at the end of August solely featured on the season finale with Luke Skywalker, that great season finale, the rescue. And uh, they're going to be breaking it all down and uh, explaining 
some of the secrets behind Luke Skywalker's return to Star Wars in The Mandalorian. I know a lot of people were really bummed that they didn't go in depth in that when the original season two Disney Gallery special came out. And I understood it because it came right on the heels of the season finale. So it's like you don't want to do a trick and then explain to everyone right after it's done how you did the trick. Let the magic hang out there for a little while. And it's hung out there long enough, so now we can start hearing some really juicy and cool behind-the-scenes stories about Luke Skywalker's return. So I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, maybe that, we'll get one for Visions. Yeah, I, I, I mean, sure, possibly, but you really got me excited talking about the galleries dedicated to that last episode, The Rescue, which we just did our Rebel Force Radio uh, commentary on that episode, so if you haven't mm-hmm. seen it, uh, or listen to it, you can check that out at rebelforceradio.com. But yeah, I mean, if there was ever an episode of The Mandalorian that needed its own dedicated episode of gallery uh, galleries, that's the one. And I suspect we'll be hearing from Mark Hamill and, and maybe even this, you know, the stand-in body actor that did the, the Luke Skywalker stuff. And I would love to see some uh, you know, on-set rehearsal footage of you know, some of the, the light. And, and just you know, the, talking about... Uh, what informed them of the lightsaber, or the, the lightsaber uh, uh, technique? Uh, we, we talked about on the on the commentary how there's there's sort of Vader like moments where he's just using the one hand versus both yeah. hands and all that stuff we like to geek out about. But I would love to hear more about love that. It. And don't forget the artificial intelligence used to make mm. young Mark Hamill voice new dialogue for right. star wars how do they do that we uh, broke that all down um remember the the company they they did it the the guy who founded the company he Crazy. talked into the software and he said now i want to sound like barack obama and he programmed he punched in barack obama in the keypad and he said a bunch of stuff and played it back he sounded exactly like barack obama that technology is amazing and a little scary too so yeah it, it, watch and out. you might be thinking you know you might be thinking it's like a speaking spell where you know every time the the, the person says the word the it has the same emphasis oh no mm-hmm. it's not like that at all it actually right. is it's, able to translate the emphasis of the words yeah. It is, yeah, it's scary. It's You can have a lot of fun with it, man. When, when this thing hits the iPhone, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> Look out, jerky <laughs> boys. <laughs> yeah, uh, it'll, Swank will be calling himself at home. Oh, I will. How is this happening? It'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be but, awesome. Uh, so, yeah, Disney Plus, a lot of good Star Wars to look forward to on Disney Plus. But Star Wars is going to eventually make it back to the movie theaters. And that's in late 2023 with Rogue Squadron. And Patty Jenkins is helming that film. And Patty obviously has mad credentials after. Uh, directing two Wonder Woman films. So she's not just some small indie filmmaker, quirky auteur that they're bringing in <laughs> to suddenly be in charge of Star Wars. No, no, sir. Patty Jenkins definitely has the uh, street cred and the experience to take on a major franchise and, uh, you know, legendary characters in legendary situations like Rogue Squadron. So she was out. Um, I don't know what event she was at, but the AP taught was they were talking to her, and uh, she did reveal that uh, despite the fact she has so many different things on her plate, like yet another Wonder Woman movie and and more, she's uh, definitely going to be shooting Rogue Squadron next. I'm in love with all three projects on my plate right now. I'm definitely doing Rogue Squadron next, and I'm excited to do Wonder Woman 3. And so, you know, these are all, and Cleopatra is coming along great as well. And so we'll see how it works out. But, um, you know, I may just never stop. I may just make movies back to back if they would let me. I, I would love it. <laughs> so she's a machine. Yeah, she's a man. Machine. Y- y- you can hear, uh, you know, the, just the absolute total dedication, you know, in her voice to her. To her craft, that's for sure. It's a it's a rare breed that just wants to put out, put out, put out, put out. Yes. And, and you know, maybe there's more Star Wars in her future. Mm-hmm. We'll see how Rogue Squadron goes. I mean, that could turn into a sub-franchise for Star Wars, actually. Sort of like what they wanted to do with Solo. Mm. But, obviously, they couldn't because the box office was uh, disappointing. Mm-hmm. Only made like four hundred million dollars or something. That's still disappointing. Yeah, I would I would argue that that double that establishing new quote unquote new Star Wars characters for for television 
where the cost of entry and the the um, ability to sort of um, tell it on a weekly basis is one thing. The, the the ease of which you're going to be able to create, establish uh, new characters in the Star Wars universe to sustain a film franchise or a sub franchise. That's another thing. And you've speculated yeah, right. that this is going to focus in the um, the era of the sequel trilogy, uh, perhaps yep. uh, just prior to the events of uh, The Force Awakens. Um, and or after. I, or, or, or even after, even after. Mm-hmm. Um, when I think Rogue Squadron, I don't think that era. When I think of Rogue Squadron, right. I think of classic trilogy era. So we don't know where it's going to land. I don't think that's been confirmed, but... No, you know why I I insist on speculating that it's going to take place in the sequel era is because Kathleen Kennedy, when announcing the film was coming out, she said it's going to be a brand new era. You mm. know, she 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 used that terminology. So I was thinking maybe even beyond the Force Awakens, but then I kind of started second guessing myself. When I heard Patty talk about what the source material is going to be for Rogue Squadron. And I really started to reconsider things a little bit. And you'll hear in this next cut, she discusses what some of that source material is going to be. I think the Michael Stackpole books and the and the video game and all of the Rogue Squadron books, I think they all have, a, there's, a, there's an incredible history that it's really important to honor. And... Um, and yet it must be brought to a new age because we have to tell a new story with it. And so you're kind of you're trying to blend the best of everything and make it the great fighter pilot movie, which I've always wanted to make as well. And so, um, yeah, you're just it's a it's a it's a big brew <laughs> of things that you're trying to put together and still keep a very simple story. Wow. Uh, you know, when, when I think you know, the fighter, the, the fighter pilot. You know, uh, classic World War II. I'm thinking of you know stories like the Memphis Bell and 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 things like that. I, 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 it's it's not a small task that that they're that they're up against. She talks about it being a brew. It, it, there's a lot to throw in there because there is quite a legacy of those of those novels that that focused yes. on the Rogue Squadron. And um, you know, I think one of the challenges is. There's such a difference, I feel, and, and, and I, could be, I could be wrong here, but there's feels like there's such a difference between movie-going audiences and the audiences watching their streaming television. And when you go see a Star Wars feature film, I feel like you go there for familiar characters, settings, concepts, ideas... And um, this this feels to me like the better play would be something situated in that original trilogy era with some of those those pilots. Mm-hmm. A la I Rogue agree. One, more Rogue One than yeah. than Force Awakens. I agree a thousand percent. Now you have to keep in mind that the Michael Stackpole books, which were started you know the x-wing squadron books rogue mm-hmm. squadron books where they were started by stackpole and uh aaron alston picked up uh those books and, and was writing them it, it, this all happened mid to late 90s uh, rogue squadron and the x-wing series and they were uh, primarily stories told following the events of return of the jedi featuring the the pilots of the new republic era sort of sweeping up whatever is left of the empire throughout the galaxy. And it focused on specific pilots, of course, Wedge Antilles and his buddy, Tycho Selchu, Wes Jansen. Remember Jansen from oh, yeah. the uh, good empire shot Jansen. Tech. He's still hanging out with wedge <laughs> and he's still making good shots. And so those guys and, and hobby also another snow speeder pilot, from Empire Strikes Back, and then a bunch of really cool new characters. And uh, it was just some great world-building going on with both the Rogue Squadron 
book series and the comic book series that Dark Horse was putting out at that time, too. I remember enjoying those very much, and fans sure enjoyed them so much that there was a rumor going around back in the day, back in the expanded universe era of the mid-'90s, when there was a rumor going around that a live-action Saturday morning network show based on the X-Wing novels was going to be made. So when Kathleen Kennedy announced Rogue Squadron was coming this past December, I immediately thought back to those old rumors. And I thought, wow, it's actually happening. This is great. <laughs> We're going to get Rogue Squadron. But then again, so so sourcing the Stackpole books. But what are they sourcing them for? Mm. The history to build upon the history or the stories to mash them into a new thing what are they actually going to be picking from these old books these books that have been now deemed legends yeah and don't you know have really canon value the other thing is she brings up take that history and bring it to a new age she yeah. specifically says it so then here i go leaning back towards mm. oh this is going to be sequel era stuff Right, and I, I, I can, I, I really think that this is going to be sequel era stuff because of that. The Stackpole books, that's where they'll get their history and build off of that. Maybe even Dennis Lawson will be in the films as an elder statesman pilot, who is coaching these new, these new pilots, these new young pilots. That would be cool. I mean, I, I, I always come back to the fact that you need something to ground you. Uh, particularly for film audiences. I, I think you need something to ground you. I mean, look at The Mandalorian. I mean, the, just the, 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 the costume itself grounds you in Star Wars. The ba Baby Yoda, yeah. the design of Baby Yoda grounds you in Star Wars. They went for very, very... Uh, whether or not that they are... Um, uh, you know, uh, whether or not they tie into majorly important canonical characters they certainly have the iconography of majorly important or you know iconic characters boba fett yoda etc um so i i feel as though this film or series of films whatever it ends up being would really benefit from that wedge antilles a bit of a deep cut but still um something that could ground the audience in in star wars firmly Mm -hmm. And the door's been open for Wedge's return with his 1.8 second cameo in The Rise of Skywalker. So <laughs> That's right. We shall see. I'm really looking forward to uh, Rogue Squadron. Just one more cut from Patty. She uh, talks about the pressure of helming a Star Wars film. And, and uh, what I hear from her in this response uh, leads me to, to find confidence in her because she's had the experience. You're trying to bring the best of yourself and use it to make something beautiful that honors the legacy before you. But of course, it's like it's a huge amount of pressure. Of, uh, and Wonder Woman was a huge amount of pressure as well. So, you know, it's not it's not a totally new feeling to me. But, yeah, definitely uh, nerve wracking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, and it should See, she's be. She's taking it seriously, so yeah, it yeah. should be. She's taking mm -hmm. it seriously. If it's not nerve wracking, if it's a walk in a park, then right, I, you know, I think we're going to expect some really bad Star Wars. Well, well imagine I, if she said, "Well, it's just another line. It's just another popcorn yeah. movie." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'd wanted to say that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I think she's approaching it the right way. She talks about respecting the legacy and. And uh, putting a fresh coat of paint on it. I, I like all that. So I, I like Patty Jenkins. I'm looking forward to Rogue Squadron. And I hope it's great. Uh, one thing, we got to hurry up because Kyle is oh, uh, waiting. Yes. Um, but I just want to bring up something here. Um, very generous, very generous listener who shall remain anonymous because of his request. I'll just call him Mr. Zero. He, uh, we met Mr. Zero several years ago at Star Wars Celebration Orlando in 2017. And he went to our kickoff bash. And uh, before the live show started, we had a meet and greet with all the listeners. And um, this guy gave us a very generous gift. And I, I, I've been touched by it. It's one of my, the, the best things in my Star Wars collection. And I have it here with me. It is a hand-carved hand sculpted hand painted desktop statue of zero the hut hello there 
Yes, I'm it's Zero the Hood, a senator in this neighborhood. All right. Well, and it's, <laughs> and it's, the- it's beautifully in scale with your three and three quarter inch figures, too. Yes, look at the craftsmanship, yeah. hand, hand sculpted, uh, hand painted, and just a perfect likeness. Uh, Hasbro so could not do any better than this, not at all. I mean, they couldn't even come close to doing work this great. And so this is given to us. Uh, Jason got one, I got one. Uh, Mr. Zero, Mr. Zero reached out to me recently at show at RebelForceRadio.com, and he said. You guys have done so much, uh, the sh- uh, helping me get through hard times in my life. He went on to tell me some personal details about some hardships he suffered through. And just the, the magic of Star Wars and the power of community that Rebel Force Radio provides really helped him get through some hard times. And so he wanted to show his appreciation for all Rebel Force Radio listeners. And he sent me a second Zero the Hut that we oh. are going to give away to a member of the RFR on Patreon community. And uh, so it's gonna. This is uh, going to be a giveaway open to all members of RFR on Patreon. Whether you're RFR Insider all the way up to our top tier RFR VIP, everyone's eligible. All you have to do is look for the post, which will be live by the time this show is uh, in the ears of our Patreon supporters. You'll see a picture of zero, and that's all you're gonna see. And uh, all you have to put underneath, you have to you have to put a comment on the thread that says, I want to party with Zero the Hut. When you do that, you'll be automatically entered into our drawing. We will pick a, a winner at random on uh, future RFR. Um, I haven't determined a deadline or anything. Let's take this to the end of the month. All so right. anyone who signs up for RFR on Patreon or any... Buddy, who's already signed up, regardless of what tier, look for the photo of Zero the Hut. It'll be on the website, patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. Only accessible if you are a member, a supporter, a current supporter. And then you put, I want to party with Zero the Hut in the comment section, and you'll be entered. And um, that's all you have to do. And we'll announce the winner on an upcoming Rebel Force Radio episode at the beginning of August. But you have to be active on our Patreon page, and you have to be a current supporter of Rebel Force Radio. Just look for that picture. I want to party with Zero the Hut. You never know. <laughs> you might be you might be Zero's roommate before this is all over with. I was going to say, uh, Padme partied with Zero the Hut. Didn't work out so well. Uh, and so did Snooty. Yeah. Snooty was Snooty. <laughs> you had to go there. You know, some of those scars are still wide open. Especially the plaster bolt she put into my chest. Mm. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, let's do it. I'm thirsty. You're thirsty. I think Kyle Newman's thirsty. Let's head on into the cantina. San Zero, Mr. Zero. No. no. I could go for a drink, actually. <laughs> Where are you going, Master? For a drink. Sorry about the mess. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. Okay, as we mentioned earlier, we got him in the cantina joining us. It's been a long time, but we got him in here. Mr. Kyle Newman, once again here on Rebel Force Radio. Kyle, always great to talk with you. Thanks for taking the time out. Be with us tonight? Of course. So good to be back in yeah. the cantina. I've got my invisible blue milk here, ready to go. Hey, you know, nice. uh, the blue milk thing. So Jimmy Mack said mm-hmm. recently, he was talking about these these uh, Star Wars, uh, th- they've become tropes, but these things that were sort of a one-off that all of a sudden becomes, uh, it becomes a thing, and it was right. never really intended to be a thing, but then it tends to like a, a, attract sort of uh i don't know i guess anybody looking to show their star wars badge they 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 throw out these things like blue milk it's a trap you know whatever these things tend to be um 
But the, the well, blue- actually, I mean, my hang up is, is uh, these are just like little background things that appeared maybe once or twice in the original trilogy. Yeah. And now they're just like showcased Everywhere. a lot of times in Star Wars. The blue TK milk, of course, that's a commodity. TK421. I'll tell you what's not what about a, you. I'll tell you what's not a thing. Green milk. That is not a thing. Well, Green n- milk, not on but purpose. Again, Galaxy's Edge. Yeah, that's just not cool. The, no, you go there and you Galaxy's, see people with the green milk and the blue milk, and you do the challenge, Jimmy, and you watch people, and, and yeah. there's the people that like they, they want to pretend they like green milk. It's a metaphor. And they're like, <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, I, I like the green milk better. Yeah, it's, it's better. And you're like, it ain't better, dude. It's just not better. All right, Kyle, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to ask, is it, uh, what do you prefer, blue milk or butter beer? What would you rather drink? I'll tell you what, the hot butter beer at uh-huh. uh, Harry Potter uh, Wizarding World is astoundingly delicious. It uh, used right. to be seasonal, only during like winter months. Um, mm-hmm. And it tastes like the best latte you ever had. Pro tip, get a shot of espresso somewhere and go dump oh it God. into your hot butter beer. Boom. It's better than the uh, slushy-esque gelatinous thickness that is uh, Star Wars milk. But it's it's. I still prefer the blue milk if I'm uh, picking my Galaxy Size be- beverages. But the Maraloon juice, I think it was called, at the um, what's that barbecue type place near where there's like a uh, one of those Jabba's Palace droids getting wrecked. Um, that Maraloon juice is pretty delicious. That's top beverage. Maraloon juice. I've never heard I think of it's Maraloon. Like- you know that stuff. That, so that's an example of something that I say. You know, it's in the background, and now this, all of a sudden, it's it's got the spotlight on it, like Han Solo's dice or moisture evaporators. I mean, these are things that are popping up all over the Star Wars universe now. They're almost yeah. universal. Uh, they're being seen everywhere. And uh, you know, Jason brings up the butter beer. Obviously, Disney's trying to cash in on that kind of thing, and, and thus blue and green milk are at the parks. But <laughs> has anyone ever noticed in Attack of the Clones when young Baru? brings out refreshments to everyone she has some it's it's more like a a berries kind of like a, a, a hawaiian punch or something yeah it's not blue food. milk which that would have been right. the obvious choice but george is like no i already did that yeah yeah he would always go for something different oh, oh my movies have different beverages <laughs> <laughs> no, they're just the same beverages <laughs> I'm pushing the boundaries. Repeating the beverages. beverages. Right. <laughs> always, always pushing the so boundaries. How many times have you been to Galaxy's Edge, Kyle? Ooh, um, uh, obviously a lot. Right? Three, three times. Just three. Okay. Um, I I had some plans to go an additional time, and then um, everyone went on COVID break, so that oh, yeah. that got thwarted, and then. Um, <laughs> I am eager to go back, but I, I I don't know how it works. You have to like win a lottery, or I don't I don't know. It just seems so complicated, and mm-hmm. it seems also exorbitantly expensive. Now I was about to get like season passes, and I think that's been eradicated. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know. I'm gonna take my little guys at some point this year. I was also eyeing the um, coveted trip to Disney World later this year, but we'll oh. see. I mean that oh. would be. You're going to Orlando. Cool to try that. I don't know. I'd like to. I don't um, know, guys. I hear I'm excited that, to go. I, I hear that Avengers Tower is uh, much cooler than Galaxy's Edge. I feel like they they learned a lot from Galaxy's Edge and then put that into Avengers Tower. I cooler? Just, just, well, it's, doesn't it just look like it a can't bunch possibly of be like, prefab square buildings? Like I don't know. <laughs> I've been hearing some good things about the the uh, the character experiences and you know the meet and greets and just uh, I'm not some really of the into the character experiences. You know, I don't need to go yeah. sit on like you don't want to sit on like Thor's Eagle's lap. lap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know they were um, offering the lap dances, but yeah, <laughs> I, might, I would wait in line for that. It just I hear I just hear uh, a lot of talk about you know many of the things that they were considering for Galaxy's Edge being value engineered out of it, and uh, I don't know. There's I, I haven't been, so I, I got to reserve judgment. But I've talked to obviously a lot of people that have a lot of people I trust. 
whose opinions I trust. And it just seems like they took a lot for granted. Like, you know, hey, we're just going to just put a pile of sand here, call it Star Wars land. And then every Star Wars fan <laughs> will come to this thing. But God uh, forbid it's, it's you play more... the music of John Williams, you know, like... <laughs> Does Marvel Land play the music from Marvel or like no music from Marvel? <laughs> you can't say Avengers Assemble. How dare you say may the force be with you. It's, may the black spires favor you. I remember I said that to an employee there. I was like, may the force be with you. And you're like, no, may the black spires favor you. And I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? What are you talking yeah. about? This I don't know. So Oh, they're not allowed to say like, may thing? the force be with you. It's too like, oh, it's too that. old school. They say, like, may the That's Black Spires weird. favor you. What the hell is the huh. Black Spire? Are, you, are we talking about it's, the Black Spires that you see in uh, Rise of Skywalker? The Spires out of... The, I don't know. What the hell are they talking about? Uh, no, what it is, it's um the, that planet. Um, the Black Spires are a geographical thing, uh, I believe. And um, they wanted to insulate it around, like, forthcoming synergistic eu and keep it all contained in that and it's interesting that they took like that's what you do as your second park you know you start with like the classic and then you do that um, yeah yeah but uh i don't know i mean I, it's it's weird so like characters i think like yoda and luke are considered like myths they'll never walk around the park it's only like um, I sort of get order, that. I, stuff. You know, I think that there's there's definitely some utility in avoiding things that are almost sacrosanct. You know, like I don't know that I'd want to see Yoda like tot waddling around. I mean, I I like the idea that he, <laughs> but 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 I well, but I but I'm with Ren? you. He walks around. Yeah, Kylo walks around. Ray, Chewie. Yeah, but it's not Yoda. I mean, there's just I something like Kylo extra. just the same as any classic character. I don't know. It's like it's weird to like if, if you're going to be part of the lexicon of nine movies and you're considered like a major character, then either you're you're in play or you're not. Yeah, uh, I don't think I think it's arbitrary. To pick I will see I, that's I'm with you. That, I'm with you there because it, they're sort of like picking and choosing what's in universe and what's not. So, yeah, I, I there's definitely uh you know, kind of make it up as you go along. I guess I don't know what the They're logic trying is. Trying to in every maintain case. the culture of this batu mm-hmm. and create it into something unique that can stand on its own and doesn't require you to be uh, steeped in Star Wars knowledge, or you know, even the, may the force be with you. I, maybe they just want to save that for Jedi. I don't know, but I I, I believe there's a. When you build those lightsabers in the workshop, there you hear these voices at one point. You hear Yoda. I'm pretty sure he says, may the force be with you and things like that. And then you ask, you say, Does who's he? that? And they go, we have no idea. Give me your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that voice is. It's, it's purely in your head. <laughs> All right. Well, let's. Um, so, so Galaxy's Edge, I haven't been. Uh, Jimmy's been there now twice. You've been there twice or just the, the one time? Can't remember. Well, twice on one trip, yeah. Twice on one trip. All right. Uh, mm-hmm. But, Kyle, you've not been to Florida, just uh, just California? Not Yeah, not recently. I haven't been there. And I haven't been to the new ride had opened. I didn't get to go, and then it closed. So I haven't even been on that. Um, Rise of the yeah, Resistance. The, the latest yeah. ride. Mm-hmm. But I did yeah, watch um, a YouTube walkthroughs multiple times so yeah um Mm -hmm. i know what it's all about it looks incredibly impressive it looks like it's gonna be my favorite ride at the disney parks i i didn't want to spoil the experience for me when i finally do get on that ride but i might break down and watch the walkthrough it's worth doing it i mean you even if you watch like star tours on on youtube to see the different planets it's still an experience to go uh sit there and and ride it it's just a different type of thing. It's um, just such a hassle so I think it's to get it. on that ride. And the parks aren't even at full capacity yet. Imagine what it's going to be like when they're at full capacity. It's, you know, I mean, it's insanity. They have to find Well, that's what they're doing. They're taking great steps to, there. like, limit the season pass holders because they just don't want a lot of casual people just, like, loitering their Thursday evening at the park. <laughs> they want to, like, yeah, right. charge you every single time you enter. And they don't yeah. want people getting a, a good deal out of it, you know. So um, those are steps they're going to like. Hopefully, limit it so it's just not always packed. 
these types of places. Well, it's been a while yeah. since we've we've talked to you, and a lot has happened in the world of Star Wars. In addition to uh, the reopening of Galaxy's Edge, as the whole uh, world attempts to reopen after the last uh, bizarre, you know, sixteen months or whatever it's been. Um, but one of the things we wanted to chat with you about is Mandalorian season two. We haven't had a chance to catch up with you since then, believe it or not. And, um, you know, th there's, there's sort of this idea of the sophomore slump, you know, whether it be an album, whether it be a season of a TV show that you can't, it's very difficult to live up to the success of the first one. How did you feel that the Mandalorian did in its, in its second season? I thought it ultimately settled into a really great place that offered far more than what I even hoped it could offer for the greater Star Wars fandom and lexicon. I think it opened up doors and branchways into more storytelling, and you saw it was supported by that announcement of all these additional shows. I think that's the greatest achievement of the show is um, the possibility and the connective tissue that, that Dave and Favreau have Im imbued it with. The fact that you really feel like, wow, I can go back to these places and I can fill these gaps and I can explore these other things and there's the proper texture and tone to it. Uh, clearly, Dave, um, and I say Dave because I, I really feel like, you know, Favreau knows his stuff as a storyteller. Dave is a, um, you know, the, the greatest probably, you know, Star Wars custodian they have working over there um, and he's the guy who's um, giving it the right like did you see what he's done with Star Wars animation Bad Batch is like just a, I, I wasn't sure how it would be you know mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that are working on it and I, I'm excited about it but I, it, it exceeded my expectations as well Mandalorian season 2 though started in a worrying place I thought it, he was more like the Arandalorian Aran like he was just running errands like gotta get bread and then he just goes <laughs> to this planet and you're like what's going on like you, you your whole plot is you got to connect to this and why are you going to this to find this? It's like, it didn't all didn't have the momentum I wanted it to. I didn't love the Tuscans in that first episode. They felt like super cosplay. Like they went to like Spencer gifts at the mall and got their co their Tuscan costumes. And they just were too like hmm. fresh off the boat. Tuscany. Uh -huh. um, the crate dragon was it totally improperly scaled. I thought that was just like, you guys did watch a new hope and see that, what these things look like. This is clearly a different creature. Um, oh, you're saying it was out of scale but, compared to the, the skeleton that we see in, in a new hope. It was also missing some legs. Um, <laughs> that skeleton didn't seem to have those, but I know there's been different interpretations of what a great dragon looks like. And there's been depictions on, you know, old tops cards and comic books and all these things. So, um, who knows what they really look like? That's all been EU until like they, they put it on screen. It just felt like it was like four times as big as I was imagining. And I, mm. I get that. They probably just kept pushing the scale up. Um, it, it still was cool. Uh, I, I, I loved it. But I felt like, you know, at first it was like a lot of like, um, you know, it felt like Quantum Leap. He's just jumping around <laughs> doing stuff. Mm. Uh, it didn't have like the thrust. And then after the fourth episode onward, it really picks up focus and momentum and it ended so spectacularly. So, but that's fine. I mean, that's, that's what episodic well, can do. It can what do you, let what you, do you di diverge and what do you think? Explore. Cause you, you had mentioned that, you know, in the wake of Mandalorian season one, we saw the announcement of all these uh, televisions, you know, all these, all these series. Actually, I think it was, it was announced technically after the season two wrapped, but yeah. Um, what no, do you it think? wasn't. Remember they held off on the, it was of right Boba before Fett announcement. Oh, it, Final. right. Because, it was right. Yeah. That's right. So, but the, it was the season two had already been, been made, but what do you think uh, Mandalorian proved to Lucasfilm Disney that what was the thing that Mandalorian proved so that they could feel good about, uh, launching or, or announcing all of these different these different series star wars works on television mm. and these guys have figured out how to do it properly because our movies yeah. weren't totally done right we need to be funneling people into this portal and now we have the food to lure them there you're seeing what they're doing successfully with marvel uh those shows are so i watch them all they're a little hit or miss um they, at least they can they take some like nice swings and they try cool things 
Um, I think Star Wars, they wanted Star Wars to be able to do what Marvel had done cinematically, but now it can, it can do it um, on the small screen. Um, and uh, it was a, a like, testing ground for this uh, technology, and you're seeing it being employed in more of their shows and in other shows, uh, but definitely being utilized in, in new ways, and it allows them to um, create a, a pipeline. So um, there's constant flow of content. I hate calling it content because these are, these are, um, mm. they feel like more than that, but, um, that's what it was. It was like, okay, you did it once, but now they did it again. I think they knew after season one, that's why they did start developing all those shows. I'm sure they were doing that concurrently with season one. Um, yeah. but there was like the real go ahead for everything to forge ahead and say, all these shows are going into, um, active development and we are ready to commit big, big dollars to it. And their competitors are. You look at Amazon with their, their commitment to um, Lord of the Rings and you look at shows like The Foundation that are coming and Game of Thrones prequels. And everyone's spending a ton of money uh, because they need that this this uh, constant flow of, of material. Which of the upcoming series are you most looking forward to? Um, Kenobi. Andor. Yeah. yeah, me too. Andor would um, be great. Kitster. <laughs> Kitster. A Star Wars story. He's gonna I'm get just kidding. they're gonna bring they're gonna it bring felt like that. when they started <laughs> listing these shows, it was like Quadaneros gets a show, Kitster gets a show, the IG eighty eight family gets a show. There was a lot. There's a couple on there where I still don't know what they are beyond the title and a and a brief log line. I think um what are they? Let's. I'll, I'll. I'll give you my my rankings on them. Do you guys know what they are off the top of your head? All right. Well, there's the acolyte. The acolyte sounds interesting. It's an, a fresh time period, right? Earlier than uh, a couple hundred years prior. Uh, that is exciting, if done correctly. Book of Boba Fett. Horrible title. It's uh, cringeworthy. Um, hopefully, they rename it in time. That's like uh, <laughs> I don't think that's happening. It's that's like, not happening. <laughs> Terrible. No way is that it's the book of Boba Fett. What is that? Is he reading a book? What does it have to? Is that like a playoff the a Star Wars story? I don't know what that has to do with anything. It like, is weird. It's it's definitely uh, as our mutual friend Paul Bateman, Bateman would say, off model for Star Wars titles. It is a it's it's odd. Um, I don't hate it. Um, but it did, it you did love strike it? me as straight. Oh, I don't love it. No, I don't love it. Do you want to see that on a vintage card when it says like an action <laughs> figure? The Book of Boba Fett. I'll take just like, about anything on a, on a, on a vintage card. Uh, you would it's too. Gross. You know it. I'm but, sure the show is going to be cool. Yeah. But it's kind of a gross title. You're just like, oh, fuck. Well, I, you know what? I thought was thinking something almost biblical. You know, like, you know, there's that you think about the, the books of the Bible, the, the apostles, you know, this is the book of Boba Like the Fett. book of like, Eli, or they're trying to go for that. Yes, it's just not really right, applicable right. to that character. He's not like a... I agree. It's not... Fi- like, the book of Obi-Wan Kenobi makes more sense than the book of Boba Fett. Or what about the book of Henry? The book of Henry. A little Colin Trevorrow shout out for book of Henry. Anyone? Book of Henry. I guess Lucasfilm would want to avoid anything having to do with Colin. But... Uh, <laughs> Right, he did a movie. The Book of, Wasn't that the name of his movie, the, Book of Henry? It was yeah. like heavily panned. The Book of Jurassic World. Are you seeing like blockbusters <laughs> named The Book of Fast Nine? No. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, yeah, Just no, get, I get a better title. It, it's not. It's not a great title, but it has potential. It to, looks cool. I mean, I mean what, what did you think of the uh, the little teaser that we got at the end of uh, season two, where you got to see? It's exciting. I love the music. I love the setting. I think it's a cool pairing of those two characters. Um, I like Boba Fett ascending to this position where he he feels like he belongs. I like the fact that he's back and he probably has something to prove. I loved him in Mandalorian. I love seeing his uh, ship. I know they've renamed his ship recently. Um, <laughs> it's now called Boba Fett. I don't Fett's think they, they, they haven't um, renamed it. <laughs> I don't think it's it's a it's, rename. It's it's a marketing thing where they're trying to suppress the usage of the word slave on a child's toy. And uh, okay. you know, somebody pointed out to me that the Bad Batch Lego uh, it also said the Bad Batch ship as opposed to the Havoc Marauder, which is the name of their ship actually. So, so I don't I don't know. Let's see, I thought that episode was. Um, 
look, Rodriguez is an awesome director. Um, stylistically, it felt like it was a little... It just it, it didn't feel as Star Wars, the action, as I was used to, especially with the cleanness and crispness of the, the, the Mandalorian and the thoughtfulness of it. It just felt like the camera was put there and it was just moving for dynamic sake. And um, it was brief. I mean, I enjoyed the episode, but it didn't feel... I was like, it was a choice, stylistically, the way they photographed it. I don't know if the whole show is going to look like mm-hmm. that. Um, but uh, Well, the tone uh, was a little different it a, with it being shot on location there in California, as opposed to within the volume. So they lost a lot of that exotic Star Wars quality by just putting it on a California hillside and, and shooting with a bunch of stunt people. That's how the camera was used, and there's a lot of, like, canted angles mm-hmm. and- and push-ins and you know in your face type stuff the lens choices are totally different it just oh, was um I was, I was just saying at the swank a few minutes ago those <laughs> lens the lenses they're using what are these people out of their freaking minds using those lenses no see this well, is the stuff i love every kyle is is a pro and that's why we're hearing that right yeah i get it george like there's a certain selection of lenses that he used when he made these the original movies there's a certain selection mm-hmm. of lenses that dave uses when he makes like um Clone Wars. It's how they oh, how, there's, how there's, character look, feels in the frame. Yes. Right. So, you know, George was sort of, um, what do they call that? Documentary style where yes. you didn't, it was more like you were watching the action than you were in the action. And that's what, you know, is, is popular these days, which is angles and, and setups where you feel like you're actually in it. And that's something that I think George wisely avoided it it, it 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 helps it create that more fairy tale storybook uh, unfolding of the at least that's my own kyle that's my layman's i never went to film school kind of you know interpretation of it but um what do you guys think and i don't think we've actually talked about this much on the show but i'm just curious so it's we we can assume that boba fett hasn't had a lot of of uh connection uh or communication with the inhabitants of Jabba's palace. And so we can, we can assume that he hasn't seen these guys since he left, you know, for, uh, on the skiff with uh, Luke Skywalker and company. So I'm just curious, like wh- wh- what do you think is his, um, we're going to find out is sort of his, his beef, why he just walks right in, kills Bib Fortuna and sits on the throne and, and, and claims this, um, this, uh, you know, this, uh, place in the underworld is it are we going to find out something that he had going on with uh, with job of the hut i mean you think it'll connect to what we knew what was going on or behind the scenes of uh something in return of the jedi i mean maybe it felt like he he felt aggrieved like he felt like he was owed it but it didn't look like java uh, um there's nothing in the canon that we know of where job across him or anyway he, right he i guess that's what i'm getting at the way yeah. he did and mm-hmm. um so he comes in there and he kind of you know aggressively takes it back i just don't know how long ago did he get out and you know Cobb vanth i guess if they're going off of aftermath and his acquisition of that armor um when was that exactly dated how long has he had it um it felt like boba fett had just gotten to Tatooine or maybe he left and came back or is he just I don't know what he's been doing for so long that he's finally tracked his armor down um, and why he's just making those moves now because um, this is set I how think many the show, years after Return of the Jedi six five, years like, I think five years mm-hmm. five or six years uh, mm-hmm. and uh, um, I think Cobb Vanth acquired the armor very shortly after the battle of after Kaku. right yeah, very shortly after, because recall, they show him uh, dealing with those uh, guys. Those guys raided the town when the Death Star yep. blew up. And that's what forced him out into the desert. And then eventually on board that Jawa Sandcrawler where he found the armor. And then, so that was within days of the Death Star being destroyed. But that or armor was already in Jawa hours. possession, which right. means Boba Fett... Um, you know, gave up that armor, got out of it pretty quickly, hours, days after he fell in. Um, then did he sit down there? Do we have to fill this in with the robot chicken episode? <laughs> no, I hope what? not. 
the, but yeah, so he's just been wandering around without his armor for five years. I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, well, I think this was going to be featuring flashbacks to mm-hmm. Boba Fett's escape from the pit. And then he probably has some sort of friction with Bib Fortuna afterwards. Um, maybe Fortuna shuts him out and uh, doesn't let him have access to the palace or any of the underworld connections. And um, so do, you, do you think I mean, Omega people... is going to be in this? I'm sorry? You think o- Omega will feature? I don't. No. I, 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 Boba I, Fett's I sister? <laughs> sister. Uh, I don't. You don't think, think so. she's no, going to be I, in it? I, I don't, you don't think there, there's that. There's that much uh, synergy happening. Yeah, well, you know, that's something I, I hadn't I really. Con- that's something I hadn't considered. Um, but I don't think they would want to box themselves in. I don't think they would necessarily want to write that far out in Omega's arc. Right. Uh, right. Well, she's so new Ahsoka. to animation. Everyone wants to take these characters and put them somewhere else when they're right where they should be right now. So I don't think I don't see Omega crossing over into live action so soon, maybe down the road. But, uh, you know, Hera shows up in the Bad Batch and all of a sudden everyone's putting her in live action. And, you know, I, I don't think it's 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 that clear cut a path. There are plenty of other other characters that are juggling right now, like uh, oh I don't know Luke Skywalker. Maybe we'd <laughs> like to see more of him. Uh, what did you think of Luke's big return at the uh, season finale of The Mandalorian? It was awesome. It was it was handled really well. It was it was the right type of entrance for Luke Skywalker into this era. I, I felt. Did you know it was coming? Were you tipped off? Were you spoiled? Or was it a shock and surprise for you? How did you feel when you saw it? It wasn't a... I was excited to see it unfolding. I didn't know. But it just made sense. It wasn't like losing my mind in a way. It was more like, thank God someone's doing this right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Thank God someone's handling Luke correctly. Yeah. And what do you think from from a storytelling standpoint? You've got... It's like lightning in a bottle. You got Mandalorian and Baby Yoda, you know, Din Djarin and Grogu. And I mean, from, you know, everything from the merchandising to the, the, just the, uh, the way that the, the duo, particularly Yoda has, Baby Yoda has come into popular culture. You know, all we know based on the end of season two is that this is really the, the, the separation of these characters and that baby Yoda slash Grogu goes off to be trained by Luke. We know what happens, you know, based on the, the, the sequel trilogy, what we know what happens to Luke's um, his, his, his Jedi uh, camp there. So I guess what the hell are they doing breaking these two up so soon? Well, I think that it, I don't take it lightly that they became part of a clan together. Um, and there are, there's an obligation. So maybe that's something Baby Yoda has to fulfill or, or vice versa. Um, I think that's why they're doing other shows in between. Maybe there's going to be a time jump. Uh, there's nothing to say that it has to be uh, directly after. Um, so uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can, you can go with it. I mean, their paths can easily cross again and, and maybe baby Yoda off screen has progressed in a certain way. Look at my, my custom baby Yoda, uh, <laughs> coaster. What is that, a coaster? Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I was, yeah, it's the first thing you think about, you're like, Whoa, you're breaking up the team. But, um, how, how long can you do that where he, he drives into town and he has someone babysit him and you know, he, he picks him back up. You yeah. got to, um, you got to open it up a little bit. So mm-hmm. they're challenging, challenging both characters. And doing yeah, so. I have a lot and of, I have uh, I challenging have, the narrative in a good I way. I have mad, mad respect for them to put the story above. I hate to say it, but you know, yes. the merchandising and the, and the, and yeah, because they could coast along for a couple of years doing this sort of adventure yeah. of the week with baby Yoda doing a few cute, cute things. I mean, we're all kids that grew up in the seventies and eighties. That was so formulaic of television back then, bring in the cute kid and all that. So I have a lot of respect for them for making that choice. That was, the, I, I look at it like they're walking away from money, you know, in a, in a sense. 
Um, but you know, for, for us as fans, what it, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, some we've speculated that it means that we're looking at a season of uh, all things Mandalore and Mandalorian reunification of the two factions of Mandalorians, uh, perhaps the resettlement of Mandalore itself. Uh, where would you like to see season three go? Well, here's the big thing to consider. All the good Star Wars titles have multiple meetings, right? Um, the Mandalorian. How do we know that's Din Djarin? Maybe Yoda, maybe Grogu is the Mandalorian that they're talking about in the title. He becomes one, doesn't he? Is he part of the clan? Maybe it's it's more well, his story. I don't know. Um, where do I want to see it go? Um, I like the universe slowly expanding. Um, I feel like the show uh, limits itself when the world gets too small. Um... It doesn't need as many, like, little references or inside things like we were talking about initially. You know, those little little moments. Uh, We're past that era of Star Wars. Those were the things that kept Star Wars alive when it was, um, you know, 1993 and it was a cult status type film. And it was um, on the cusp of disappearing or slipping into that permanent uh, place where it was just like... Do you remember those series of films? You know, mm. it obviously became something much, much bigger, um, thanks to Bendham's the action storyline, <laughs> which kept things alive. Yeah, I'm glad that it days. didn't end up like you know the never-ending story and in, in, in some of those kind of '80s things thanks that we to look back. Mike, the Micro Machines Galoob line uh, just <laughs> changed the way we think of story. Hey, no, you know um, what? It, hey, those things kept Star Wars alive, man. The micro collect or not micro just like yeah. Angry Birds micro did for a few years. Remember Star Wars? Yeah. Angry oh, Birds. How about the M M&M and M guys? I, I mean, anything. Oh my God, <laughs> classic. <laughs> Hideous. Classic story. Uh, Kyle, <laughs> listen. Oh, know, God. I, I, I got to do this because I promised our Patreon uh, supporters that I would ask you a few questions from them about fanboys. So you got a couple minutes to take some fanboys questions? Heck, yeah. Heck, yeah. All right. Well, let's start with uh, Andrew. Andrew asks, have you thought about what the guys would be up to around the sequel trilogy and how they'd react to it? Oh, yes. You know, one thing we are trying to do is to do more stuff with fanboys. So yeah, um, that stuff we'll hopefully talk about more soon. What they would be up to, obviously, the world of fandom has it, it not just changed during the prequels. Um, as, the, as the world expanded in the late 90s and early 2000s, franchises sprung up, geek culture became mainstream um and now it's to the point where it's almost gotten smaller i feel like star wars has gotten it's not that it's old hat but it's become almost a niche thing again because it gets so specific um i don't i think what the guys would be very divided and honestly divided on it you know um I think there's people that will would see the merits of the movies, the way I look at the, the, the sequel trilogy. I know there's a lot of people that now just want to auto-hate it, and I think it's there's still so many great things in the sequel trilogy that I that I absolutely love. There's And there's the characters that would be, you know what, like Hutch would probably be like, you know what, man, like some people say the prequels ruined my childhood. He'd be like, the last Jedi ruined my adulthood. That's probably what he would be like. Um <laughs> And, you know, he would speak to, you know, 60% of Star Wars fans. Like, there's a lot of people that probably be like, yeah, Hutch, I, I go Hutch, I'm a Hutch. Uh, there's a lot of people that'd be like, you know what? Star Wars needed that change, and that'd be more, maybe uh, Windows would be more analytical and, and uh, positing a theory that, like, you, you can be uh, reductive and subversive and, and um, subvert expectation without purpose just to why not just do it you know I lo- a lot of people I love that love Last Jedi they just love they don't they like chaos they don't like they like Star Wars like I don't like Star Wars anyway that movie was great because it was just like screw all that crap it's a stupid franchise you know that that's why they love it <laughs> well you, you, know? you that's who you really like, want to impress cool. with, a, with, with, with your uh, <laughs> installment into one of the most beloved franchises in the world let's go after the people yeah, that like, don't Hutch like, be, like Hutch would be like the kind of guy that's like, let me get this straight. You know, Hutch is like, 
Han Solo is someone who like sold his metal for some booze and like <laughs> on top of booze her dad and an estranged husband like who referred to being a scoundrel and a s- swindling his way through life like only get killed by his own son like he'd be this you know he'd be like you took the greatest hero of like the galactic civil war and he became a coward off screen and he ran away and then he did it to the other coolest character he'd probably be pretty pissed so would he be um, driving an avengers mobile uh, no way i uh, no, he'd still be, be he'd still be a star wars fan like i think Hell you can yeah, you would. can be critical and be a star wars fan um and like I, I, I'm critical of Last Jedi. I still, there's parts of the movie I really love. There's, there's, yeah, I like I the mean, end. To like all, to like the the sequel trilogy, you know, you have to say there are certain things in it that are they are what they are. So I've I've just grown to accept it. Complaining about it's not going to change anything. So That's I true. think there's just characters that are gonna, um, they're gonna see different things in it, the merits, and that would be a point of contention, but it wouldn't diminish their their fandom. All right, here's a question from Jeff. Who says, was it always your intention for Seth Rogen to play three different roles in Fanboys, or was it just a spur-of-the-moment thing? Um, when I first started talking to Seth about it, um, the idea came up uh, in a Peter Sellers, uh, Doctor Strange Love kind of way, just having somebody play multiple characters. So just to get him in the movie more, because he really wanted to be a part of it, and he's hysterical. So... Um, it wasn't written in the script to say, you know, this will be played by the same person. Uh, it wasn't like we were hiring somebody to play all three. Um, the two of them were definitely intended. And then uh, having fun with him be the um, the um, Klingon-esque door guard was a, a bonus third. Eric from Phoenix asks, how hard was it? to get Lucasfilm on board to support the movie? Um, it was it was a process. Uh, we didn't go to them too early. They became aware of the project. We um, presented to them the, the script and what our plans were and what we needed of them. And um, I think that process, they saw that uh, we were passionate and we were genuinely fans and we never wanted to do anything to malign Star Wars and ultimately George um, had a conversation with one of our producers and gave him the blessing to do so provided that uh, the movie always remained in a place where it wasn't disparaging towards um, his creation I mean poking fun is one thing but um, uh, slandering or criticizing it at at the expense Mm -hmm. Is something else. So yeah. we, we he's been, he's we been such that. a fan of parody. I mean, uh, George has yeah. sought out parody. Uh, if you you so know, we honored like that. Guy. Yeah. But then George, um, when the movie was being re-edited, George did weigh in a little bit, and um, we reflected to Harvey Weinstein that um, he backed uh, my version of the movie, which was not the version that was trying to. Um, throw fans under the bus a little bit and make fun of them as opposed to poke fun. So uh, he also stayed, uh, remained steadfast with the PG-13 rating um, Mm. when, you know, our studio was trying to um, turn it into more of a raunchy R um, to capture a different audience. Uh, So he, he was like, nope, never going to happen. PG-13. All right, this this fascinating. I, this this I question never knew George injected himself into the actual process of choosing which edit would be the one that got the green light. It wasn't that it's so he, cool. he did just say you can't change the rating and mm-hmm. the the tone of what we had shown uh, and made was in line with what. Um, we had uh, scripted and promised, whereas the other material was not. So I don't know what the exact conversation was, but I know reflected through Weinstein Company was that um, he was supportive of um, an earlier version. You know, you guys did respect George Lucas, and to me, fanboys always felt like a love letter to Star Wars. But uh, you didn't hold back on attacking the old Trek. And uh, everything from the Khan statue to uh, the battle between the uh, Starwoids and the uh, Trekkies, 
It was uh, it was hilarious. And Tony was wondering uh, if you still think that there is that strong divide in fandom these days between the Trekkers and the Star Wars fans. First of all, um, regarding Trek, I am a Trek fan. Um, we had an agreement or in, in a verbal thing with Viacom that was um, to use Trek on screen and we these costumes and everything and it was going to be a fun Trek thing and then um, about nine days before the movie we were supposed to shoot that they they pulled out and reneged on all that stuff Viacom the whores at Viacom Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) thus the rewriting uh, to savage them because they really screwed us Um, Uh. and you know Seth had a lot of fun with that and wanted to go further with it. And so Star Trek got that uh, end of the stick because um, the the parent company uh, didn't want to have fun and they kind of uh, screwed us, reneged. So um, they got what was due. But look, Khan has a giant member running down his thigh, which which is sculpted there in bronze. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, C. Schultz um, even kisses him on the lips. Uh, That's so right. <laughs> it, there, there, it, Star Trek became like you know the the adversarial thing for the sake of that narrative. Um, the rivalry, I think, is it's been neutered by the fact that there's just so much more now. Um, yes, yeah. right, right. They're so not the more. only two at the party. Yeah, exactly. It was used to be, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, Farscape, Babylon Five, and maybe <laughs> oh, like Stargate. On. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a, there was a couple are like charity throw-ins like, there. <laughs> Space 1999. They're like, oh, that's a great show. You're like, get out of here. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, it's a different time. There's obviously yes. you look at what's on television now, and you've got like a new Marvel show every month, and you've got like in- incredible IP being um, brought to the big screen at the highest possible quality, and then you see what Star Trek's doing, and it's it's not even like I don't know. I tried watching one of those new shows. It's hard. Um, They're so dropping f bombs in Star Trek. No, I mean, that's like a thing. I, I got through most of the first season, and I just wasn't compelled to keep going. It wasn't awful; it just wasn't compelling. And um, I, I don't know what else is. I don't know what they're doing on the cinematic level. I just feel like it's been um, left behind. So I don't think there's that rivalry. But you know what? The other day, like, I was in Canada for a while, and the best thing about Canada is they have a channel that just plays Star Trek. Uh, wow. I don't know what else they have up there in Canada, <laughs> but there's this channel, and all the time I'd be in my my crummy hotel, and every day I'd be like, Mondays are OT Trek, you know, original Trek, and Tuesdays are Next Generation, and there was wow. Deep Space Wednesdays, wow. and so that's all I would watch at night, <laughs> and I loved it. Um, and I was like, Where's that channel here? I could lose um, myself for months uh, if that if that was on here. You'd find me months. I later. know it's great, but there's just there's nothing like that like happening with Trek right now. It's all no. it's the old stuff uh, that's really the the torchbearer. So um, I don't feel like it's kept up with um, Star Wars in a viable or relevant way. But I have a strong affinity for the old yeah. stuff, and um, it doesn't diminish the quality. Well, it's of hitting fifty five years. Star Trek, all the stuff wouldn't exist. I mean, Star Star Trek was like the first great, you know, after Twilight Zone, the first great like episodic, um, you know, sci fi fantasy thing on, on television that had like um, really captured imagination the way it did. So, it, everybody owes something to Star Trek, and they always will. Well, that's that, those are nice sentiments, um, but I still say, get off our land. <laughs> Trekkers. <laughs> All right. I don't always. I always I, keep I, it I, honest. I am, I am a Star Trek fan. Honest too. opinions, Jimmy. <laughs> you know, when it comes to Star Wars, I, look, Star I always say yeah. honest, Jimmy. You know, I, and and some people are like, well, you're very critical of this movie or that movie. And since I've been coming on your show, how long has it been now? Like 14, 15 years? <laughs> a long yeah. time. Yeah. I have always kept it honest, whether it's reviewing Clone Wars episodes. And I am this friends with the people that make this stuff. And I and I'll, I'll say this wasn't my favorite episode, or this was what was what mm-hmm. I would have done differently. Or the, and that's I, I don't normally talk about movies in that way. 
because I know how hard it is to make a movie and the passion and commitment mm. and effort it takes to make one. But I was a Star Wars fan, fan before I was a professional filmmaker, and I, I talk about mm-hmm. it in a honest, real, and constructive way. That's what I tried to do. Well, that's so, why we love talking um, to guys like you. We love talking to FJ because you bring a very unique perspective because you haven't lost your fandom uh, and yet you, you, you work in the industry that, that, that created the thing that inspired your fandom. And it's a very unique place to be. And it's a, it creates a very unique perspective. So it's always, it's very always good to hear. And FJ, I loved hearing FJ on your show and he was, um, keeps it colorful and, and, and real as well. And, um, you know, it's never to hurt anyone's feelings. If you like something, great. If I don't like what you like, great. I'm not offended. You know, we're just talking about it. There's as a fans. difference that's between be. being that, critical that's... and being cruel. And there's no, there's, yeah. there's certainly no intent to be cruel. Uh, I'll still take bad Star Wars over good just about anything else. And um, that's totally... a relative term. Um, but uh, but uh, but what it does do is is just like if you've got you know, people around that are uh, fans of a particular sports team, things get heated. You start saying, you know, a few drinks later or whatever. And, you know, you're saying all kinds of crazy things. That's just the way it is. And, and, and this kind of passion is no different. And the, and the people that want to sort of bottle it and put, you know, uh, gates around it and, and, and um, safeguard it from little hurt feelings, just go, go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. That's not what fandom. It's just right. not what fandom is. Fandom no. is like it's healthy discussion and and debate, and yes. you're allowed to talk about what you respond to, and that's what's great about it. Everyone can find something different. Everyone can enter into that discussion, find something they respond to, and like it and adhere to it, and manifest it and get tattoos of it, and only buy those <laughs> characters. You can do whatever you want. It's customizable to you. And there isn't one thing where you, you have to like these things in order to maintain your status as a fan in this. If you don't like it, you don't like it. And that's totally okay. I mean, my goal is to try and find a way to um, wrap my head around everything to understand it. I just want to be a fan. I want to be like a historian of it. I want to understand it. I want to mm. uh, be able to talk about it in um, an intellectual way beyond just a reactive way. Well, you know, I will so say I real, like reading all the books real, and talking real about quick, them and you're you're on your way because I've got a copy of this new book, Secrets of the Force, the complete uncensored, unauthorized oral history of Star Wars. And whether you knew it or not, you're quoted in here. So you are quoted in an oral history of Star Wars. So I think you have actually uh, met your goal as being not just a fan, but a historian from a certain point of view. And uh, of yes, course, if you, you want to, well, if you want some uh, yes. royalties, you better check these guys out. Hey, Kyle, we've loved hearing you shoot from the hip talking about Star Wars here on Rebel Force Radio for almost 15 years now. And uh, it all started with you giving us fanboys production updates, behind the scenes, calls from the set. And uh, here we are all these years later looking back on fanboys with uh, such fondness. And I feel such a connection to that film as we... Uh, we're with you at Star Wars Celebration 2007 when you showed it to uh, an audience of Star Wars fans for the first time. Not the whole film, but a lot, a healthy dose of clips. And uh, you can currently watch Fanboys streaming now on Amazon Prime Video. And did you know you can watch it for free on YouTube? There's ads, but you can watch it on demand anytime you want for free on YouTube. So uh, if you haven't checked out Fanboys, please check it out. We love it. We love you so much, Kyle. You're a great friend of ours here at RFR. And uh, I I, I think... um, from public Kyle, interviews. we've loved we hearing you from shoot from the hip talking about Star Wars here on Rebel Force Radio for almost 15 years now. And uh, it all started with you giving us fanboys production updates, behind the scenes, calls from the set. And uh, here we are all these years later looking back on fanboys with uh, such fondness. And I feel such a connection to that film as we... Uh, we're with you at Star Wars Celebration 2007 when you showed it to yeah. uh, an audience of Star Wars fans for the first time. Not the whole film, but a lot, a healthy dose of clips. 
And uh, you can currently watch Fanboys streaming now on Amazon Prime Video. And did you know you can watch it for free on YouTube? There's ads, but you can watch it on demand anytime you want for free on YouTube. So uh, if you haven't checked out Fanboys, please check it out. We love it. We love you so much, Kyle. You're a great friend of ours here at RFR. And, uh, I, you know, I, I feel guilty we've been holding you up for so long. Um, do oh, we have I'm, a few I'm more here. minutes? Or if you, okay. I do. I have a few more minutes. Right. So if you guys... Because well, that was like a beautiful sign-off I was giving you right there. But if, if we can keep you on here. Because the reason I this wanted the, to keep you on. This is the bonus so, scene. Yes. This is the bonus. <laughs> yeah, this is the post credit scene here. And uh, the reason I wanted to hold you on for just a few more minutes is because you sent us this cool article with a link to a podcast about Brian De Palma. And Brian De Palma talking about when he first saw the Star Wars rough cut at a party George a dinner party George Lucas threw for a bunch of his industry pals like Spielberg and uh, and others were there and uh, Brian De Palma appeared on the Light the Fuse podcast and uh, this subject came up the Light the Fuse podcast a podcast all about the Mission Impossible films and De Palma directed the first one and uh, they brought up this Star Wars thing I got some information about the dinner. Before we actually hear the uh, clips, I just want to get people up to speed on what this is all about. As I said, George Lucas had this dinner party. I'm looking at the Making a Star Wars book here right now. And here you can even see there's a picture of the dinner party. I don't know how well you guys can see that. but they're all Look there. at it. There it can is. you guys see it? Yeah. yeah. They, they all had uh, spaghetti. I don't know. <laughs> hey, look at it. George got his, his little sweater. Yep, and there's you can see there's Brian De Palma. Yeah, this is historic. So that's the photo. The story behind the the screening is uh, this was a rough cut George was showing to some of his industry pals to get their you know take their temperature about Star Wars, and uh, here in the book, Making of Star Wars by J. W. Rinsler, under the um, the title Notorious Preview. The notorious GL having a notorious preview. Uh, it says uh, he had shared his successive drafts with his close friends. Lucas screened his rough cut for many of the same sometime in mid February 1977. Among the attendees were Brian De Palma, Matthew Robbins, Hal Barwood, the Hewicks, Steven Spielberg, Jay Cox, and a few people from ILM. I uh, usually show the rough cut to several friends to. Let them tear it apart and find out if there's anything I could do to improve it, Lucas says. Only Brian, as is his nature, said anything really negative about it. So, <laughs> so De Palma has this reputation as being this guy. You know, the only one of George Lucas's friends who really crapped all over Star Wars <laughs> when he saw the, uh, the, the rough cut. Um, this is George Lucas recounting the dinner party, okay? Steven said, this is the greatest movie I've ever seen, and it's going to make a hundred million dollars. The Hewicks were dubious. They were worried about it and me. But Brian was saying, what's all this force shit? Where's all the blood when they shoot people? You know, Brian, that's the way he is. He does that to everybody. He's very caustic. <laughs> that sounds like a fun dinner so party. <laughs> So there's the Palma. So the guys from the Light the Fuse podcast asked the Palma about this situation, and the Palma, you know, he spins it. He said, you know, it says it's not exactly like that. He wasn't totally negative about it. So here's his first cut where he's talking about seeing George Lucas's Star Wars rough cut for the first time. Blame me as the guy that says the worst thing that drives everybody crazy. But if you're going to show me something, I'm going to tell you what I think about it. Why am I there unless I'm going to give an honest appraisal of what I've seen? And in this case, you know, the fact that Stephen says that only he saw the possibilities of Star Wars, that's not really true. We all saw it as a terrific thing that George had done. And we were well aware of where the special effects weren't there and how had they had cut in all these planes from other movies to be things that were supposed to be, you know, the ships and stuff like that. 
But I did make a joke about the force. That's true. <laughs> yeah. What's all this force? All... You know what? Kyle, well, have you ever been in a situation where you showed a rough cut of your film to someone and they were uh, a little negative? Uh, all the time. And that's what you want as a filmmaker. So I'm going through that process right now. I'm, I'm locking picture on my new movie. And uh, from about three weeks in the edit bay onward, which is very premature, uh, you know, a lot of peers wait a lot longer to show people, I start bringing people in and, and showing them the, the movie. Because the more I watch it, the more I get a feel for it, the more I see how people respond to it and how they interact with the material gives me a better understanding of not what's in my head or what I hope to do, but what really exists that I'm editing. Um, so what George is doing here is something that's very healthy and normal. It sounds like he's actually doing it late in the game. This said it was a mid-February dinner and the movie came out in May. Um, right. So it's not a lot of time to do it. You can't <laughs> reshoot. Um, it's purely uh, he's looking for editorial uh, feedback. He's looking for pacing. He's looking for clarity. Um, you know, Rise of Skywalker had a lot of... Uh, Could be looking for compliments, editing, too. Rewriting. You watch the movie, people give feedback, and you're like, this isn't working, or change this, make this uh, dialogue off screen, and you can collapse these parts together, and you can... Or maybe you need someone to say off screen something to really hit home, this is happening. Like that That material... You know, after I was talking about the, the scenes with with Han and, and Leia and in Force Awakens, a lot of that was all off-screen dialogue. And you do that editorial. That's stuff you can do when you can't reshoot after you've reshot, and you still have to like accentuate and and um, really hit home a story point or, or an emotion. So that's what George is looking to do in this screening. What you do as a filmmaker, you're sitting down and you're hoping everyone's going to, it's awesome, I love it. If you just did this one little thing, you're hoping for that type of simple feedback. Um, and so it is challenging when you have somebody like De Palma, but you want those people to come in and say, your crawl sucks. It's cheap. <laughs> Rewrite it. Reprint it. Like, But it sucks. And that sounds like he uh, – more in what he said is he did have a big hand in rewriting the opening crawl of Star Wars. Yeah, we got that clip um, actually. Jason, why don't you fire yeah. that off? Here's De Palma talking about uh, his specific hang-ups about the Force. And he does get into a little bit of uh, the crawl here and, and explains his contributions to that. I just thought the idea of the Force is like, you know, the Force, I would say – but I'd kept repeating it, you know, like, it, it doesn't seem like a great name for this kind of spiritual guidance, the force. <laughs> so needless to say, I had a lot to say about the force, which obviously I was terribly wrong about. But the other thing was that no one knew what was, you know, you know, the movie starts in chapter three. We're in a world nobody's ever knows anything about he's got all these funny names for people and i said george you've got to set this up somehow like those crawls in the uh, flash gordon movies where you you know uh, but george had that idea but it was all gobbledygook basically so i and jay cox went over the crawl and basically uh, rewrote it there you go just Ooh. like kyle was saying Interesting. I had no it's, idea that, that Brian De Palma helped write that opening crawl. I wow. heard that, actually, that story for a little bit about De Palma. Um, you know, like, just something in the film I'm doing right now, there's, I put a tiny crawl. I wouldn't say it's like Star Wars, but it's more like, you know, Blade Runner or some text at the beginning. And a couple of really great filmmakers, you know, won the biggest Emmy last year, and another guy, you know, produced The Force Awakens, you know comes in and they gave me a little bit of feedback and they're like, you know what? For the uninitiated, just say this. Just say it out front. And it wasn't something that was scripted or planned, but you put it there and suddenly it changes the way people feel about the rest of the, the movie. And so I can see the, the importance of George's crawl in this movie because it sets the entire tone. It's your, it's your launch. It's your first shot, really. I mean, you're seeing words floating into space and how they're written and how efficient they are changes the way the rest of the material is going to be perceived forever so um, wait that's true they I'm are sure they are so simplified it for george in a way because you look at like the phantom menace crawl and people would criticize that um and maybe that needed another pass or, or an edit you know um 
but I, I think it's that's just part of the process and part of the filmmaking process it's not like painting which I do like you make that for yourself you know you're making a movie you want to know how people experience it in a, in, a, in a room or a community and how they react to it and how they interpret it and that's just part of that that connection you get with cinema and um, so I love screening it for people so George that's what I do you, you invite your, your filmmaker friends in you're like alright there's no visual effects like here he had dogfight stuff in it you know, my movie, I have 980 missing visual effects. People have to come in and watch it and they're like, imagine what's on screen that all these characters are reacting to. Um, and if you're doing your job right, I'm just like, uh, I'm sure George was doing with his cut at that late, late stage, people are reacting to Han and Luke's reactions to blowing up ships in the dogfights or uh, what's happening in the kinetically in that battle uh, at the Death Star. Like you see the, the VFX, but you just haven't figured, mapped in all the... The, the exterior shots of the, the motion track ships and but you cut to the interiors and you've got the pilots and then does it work on a um, on a pace level does it work on a thrilling action level even if the effect isn't right so I'm sure they could all see the potential of Star Wars that there was something magical here but um, you want people to come in and kick your movie in the ass like De Palma did hmm. And thankfully he did, because he probably made Star Wars a better movie, because Brian De Palma sat in the room and bitched and was like, George, do better. You know, <laughs> and you get lazy. Not that you not even that you get lazy, you get complacent. You're used to seeing your movie a hundred times. You want yep. someone to come in fresh, Vic. You don't need that. That whole little thing there, 30 seconds of this character saying this to this character, who cares? Cut it. You think, oh, sh- wow, I don't need it. Okay, you're right. Oh, my God, you know. So, or sometimes you've got stuff that you think you don't need. And you, you come in and someone's like... No, you actually need this, but you need to go just push that thought a little farther. And suddenly you're like, oh, this unlocks all these other things. So that process of having trusted friends and filmmakers, thankfully, you know, George had like like the greatest group maybe ever assembled coming in to watch his his films, um, helped birth Star Wars is what it was, you know, because he had these great minds coming together and rooting for him as friends. Say, I want your movie to be great. You're not you're not going to watch someone's movie to like make it worse. Uh, sometimes you impose too much of yourself when you're giving notes. You're like, do this and do this, and someone the filmmaker doesn't have the notes. He doesn't you know, he doesn't have the, the footage to go do it. He doesn't have the resources to go reshoot. But the filmmaker knows what they have or they don't have. You know, and something like a crawl is something that's free almost to, to go rewrite. It's very easy. So you always gotta keep your mind open. And George is an editor at heart. You know, he's always classified himself as that even before he's a writer or anything else. So I think he understands that process of editing and how malleable and flexible things are and how you can change the perception of something by the omission of something. Um, and uh, you know, that's why it's, you, you were talking earlier about Star Wars. It's such a, it's a montaged film. You go into the cantina and you feel it. it's, 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 it's a symphony of quick shots, you know? Uh, you look at how J, JJ did like, um, you know, Mas Kanata's castle and you float in and you kind of drift through it all George was like cut 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 this character's doing this you don't even get a full spatial sense but because you compound all these shots together it feels like something and you get a texture from it and that's just the type of filmmaking George is about like that opening montage of Apocalypse Now which George had a heavy hand in um, helping with Francis on um, so um I think George respects that that process of editing, and that's that's why you bring those guys in because you want that that tough critical feedback. You don't want to release the movie and find out the crawl could have been better, or this <laughs> yes. wasn't right. Was You'd rather too hear slow. it from your friends he, than the than the box office. That's for right. sure. This is the type of Hollywood insider insight that Kyle Newman's been bringing to Rebel Force Radio for the past almost fifteen years, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why we love talking to you so much, Kyle. You got the movie coming up. It's called One Up. Do we have a release date for that one yet? It is uh, early 2022. It's coming out. Uh, Lionsgate is releasing it. Um, It's in association with BuzzFeed Studios. It's BuzzFeed's uh, first movie. It's in the world of competitive esports and video games. Uh, it's also like a nostalgic throwback to all the video games and things we grew up with from, you know, Contras and Golden Eyes and Mario Kart and Pac-Man. It's all, it's all layered in there. Um, Pong. Because I'm a <laughs> Pong. Yep. Uh, it's a, 
It's a smorgasbord of video game references and pop culture stuff. Um, it's about a group of girls who form a um, collegiate esports team, kind of like you know, a league of their own or Pitch Perfect, and uh, take on a uh, patriarchal system that really doesn't have a lot of room for them. It's it's. Um, well, I'm pretty proud of it because it's an empowering thing. It's just about how anybody, no matter what, who you are, where you're from what you look like, uh, you can game, you know, and there shouldn't be gatekeepers preventing you from doing that. And, um, it should be, uh, inspirational for people to get out there and game. And if you haven't gamed in a while, hopefully it gets you back wanting to get in front of a console or an arcade system or, <laughs> or, uh, even on your phone and getting back into it. Um, but it's a very, uh, fun and funny, uh, movie and I'm uh, super super proud of it so I can't wait till it comes out well please come back and I've been doing all pandemic yes yeah, this has been well, my pandemic uh, project <laughs> well I shot during the height of pandemic in Toronto and you know uh, now things are opening back up again and you know it's been good that's when I was just as it was time for me to show the movie to people to get some feedback was when things started to open up again so it was all timed out well well perfect your timing is impeccable well, best of luck and uh, yes. yeah, so please come back and talk to us when the movie is ready to be seen, and we'll uh, look forward to that very much. Always Absolutely. good to talk to you, Kyle. It's called, it's called the Book of One Up. The so I, re, I, re- <laughs> it. I just wanted it to be as cool as possible. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's Take care, great. buddy, and uh, all Thank the love you, to the family. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Love you guys. Be See good. Ya. Thanks again. Anytime. What'll it be, fellas? How much for the phaser gun? For the phaser gun? Sorry, Garfunkel. We don't hawk Trek here. Well then, Slim, if you don't sell the Trek, then why do you have a phaser gun in the case? We keep this one here to suss out Trekky bitches like yourselves and tell them to get the hell off of our land. So get the hell off of our land. Get the hell off of our land! Get the hell out of here! Now! Get out of here, you Kirk-loving Spock suckers! Rebel for the strength.